असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शाति 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 टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू स्टडी सेल्फ डिस्कवरी सो दिस इज अ प्रफाउंडली इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक हाउ टू डिस्कवर द सेल्फ दिस इज वॉट दिस कोर्स इज एक्चुअली अबाउट and we are going to that is why study some very intense techniques of yoga and vedant dekhiye ye pura practical hai hai na isko actually karna padega but since it's part of this course it the theory will be discussed in these lectures before you embark on anything like self discovery the fundamental thing required is self discipline isn't it even if you want to sim- simple concentration simple achievements you require certain amount of self discipline now in this uh, module we will be dis- that is why discussing some forms of self discipline which are commonly recommended kehte hai na thodi si tapasya chahiye in order to get this why do you need tapasya what is tapasya first of all practice of self discipline yes certain a level of self discipline so that your energies rise to a particular level intensify tap ka matlab hi hai to heat up which means to increase energy so if you bring your energies to a particular level another dimension opens up for you and this object of this tapasya it is not something in the external world isn't it it is that self which is illumining your mind so that you can perceive objects in the external world how will you know that how to know the knower how to know that due to which the perception is taking place the source factor so you must get the ability to turn the mind inwards just like how the senses can be turned inward yes huh? you can block perception by turning in the senses and so also you can turn the mind inward because the object of the goal of your search is the self so self discovery is brought about by all these processes initially always what is suggested is a certain level of inner discipline so that you can successfully do this tapasya isliye isko tapasya kehte hain a way of turning inward now in uh, the yogic sciences it is called pratyak pravanata which means the tendency of your mind to so turn inward that it interiorizes your consciousness your mental awareness becomes very clear and deep as it were which means there is more intensity of awareness in your mind than merely the thought process thoughts are coming and going you see for most people they are not thinking thinking is happening this is their state thoughts are going on whether they like it or not whether they want it or not thoughts are going on but for you can't afford to be like that if you have solid goals to achieve your thought process should be in your hands isn't it it should be well directed towards your purposes your goals so initially what is told to us is a certain amount of inwardness of mind is required so that your thought process becomes objective your thought is as much an object as anything else you are getting mixed up with it that's the whole problem so if your thought process becomes a little objective you see any yogic method will give you this as the first step if it becomes uh, if your thought becomes an objective process to you you can handle it well so this is ye pehla kadam hai this is the way to interiorize your very awareness and intensify it so when this becomes a possibility what is the experience you get see let the usual example given in yoga is the example of a lake vivekananda bhi example dete the hmm? a, a lake imagine a simple lake a lake which has very clear waters you can actually see the bottom of the lake isn't it but if the waves it's very wavy on the surface can you see the bottom of the lake or if the water is very turbid unclean 
Can you see the bottom of the lake? You can't see. So, two factors are required to see the crystal clear, to see through the waters. What is required? Stillness is required on the surface of the lake and clarity of the water is required. It should be clean water. Then you can see the bottom of the lake. Your mind is also like this. If there are not too many waves on the surface, which means your thought world is well regulated, well controlled, because you have managed to make thought an object, you are directing your thought process and the mind is relatively clean, the waters of the mind are clear, then you can see what is at the bottom. The yogic sciences will tell you the actual substratum of your mind is consciousness. Mind is nothing but thoughts bubbling upon a substratum of consciousness. So, if you remove those thoughts, awareness should remain over. But if, if we just remove thoughts in our present state of mind, many times it is possible we fall asleep, is not it? Because we have not cleared this mind, this, this level of clarity has not come and it is very wavy on the surface also. So, these are the two reasons why we are not able to see the bottom of this lake. The very fact that your thoughts are enlivened experiences for you shows that awareness is behind the thought process. It is involved in the thought process. So, if you are able to control thought, you can reach that awareness. This is the simple equation of yoga. Mind is equal to thoughts plus consciousness. So, consciousness will be equal to mind minus thoughts. This is yoga. So, how to do this? Easier said than done. Is it so easy? Hmm? It is difficult to do because of the restless nature of our mind. You know, Vivekananda used to say, the mind is like a crazy monkey. Hmm? Already it is a monkey and then it is drunk and then it is bitten by a scorpion. How will that monkey be? Sometimes the mind behaves like that. It is so very difficult to control, but it is not impossible. If you have a strong will, if you are purposeful and goal oriented, nothing is difficult, is not it? Hmm? So, even this process that we are discussing, it is a perfect possibility with any of us. If you learn the art of training the mind, so yoga is the science which teaches you this. It is that which teaches you how to bring your mind under control. Yoga ka matlab hi hai, it is union. Union of what? Union, union of the Jivatman with the Paramatman, which means to say your, what you are calling yourself discovers the real you, discovers the unchanging aspect of you, the unchanging I, which is nothing but the self, pure consciousness. So, is ke liye jo method hai, usi ko hum yog kehte hai. Now, before I start into, go into the technicalities, technical aspects of yoga. Let me tell you the practical method to do this. You have already been, been given a practical method, yes? I hope you are practicing it. Do not skip it. The practice is most important. Tabhi aapko all these concepts will become relevant to you. Otherwise, they will appear like some philosophy which, uh, which has no meaning to my life. They, things become relevant when they enter your system. So, if you are practicing that 5 minute meditation, you can be sure you will relate to these concepts in a very big way. What happens? What is the fundamental requirement of yoga? The fundamental requirement is a certain stillness of your body and mind. See, a yogi's characteristic feature is stillness. His behavior, his thought, his very look, his posture, there, there it holds a certain amount of stillness. Why? He is trying to quiet the system to see what is beyond. So, uh, bringing a certain level of stillness and stability to your own personality will give you intense clarity of mind. Jaha chanchalye hota hai, restlessness hota hai, their clarity will not remain. Everything gets mixed up. So, this is the fundamental thing. If you want to improve your concentration, your focus, if you want to remain motivated by yourself all the time, you must learn to still your system so that the mind simply awakens to reality. 
So to achieve this, there are certain fundamental disciplines given to you in yoga. Aapne yam aur niyam sunne hai? Yam and niyam are the basic, very simple disciplines given to you in order to achieve this stillness, the stability of body and mind and to be able to go into real yoga. Otherwise, it is a, you know, many things are passing for yoga today. So, without any discipline, without any commitment, if you dive into it, you will get a very little out of it. But if you do it as it is required to be done, you will get what you are seeking, what you have asked this course for, you will get that. So, yam ka, there are five uh, disciplines in yam, hmm, the fundamentals of yoga. One discipline is, uh, the first one is what is called ahimsa, non-violence, a non-violent attitude of mind. You please check your thought process and see what you are calling negative thoughts. Many of them are violence based, anger, hatred, jealousy, there are, there, it's tinged with violence. Himsa buddhi kehte isko. You do not want it to happen, but it has become part of your thought process. So, removing this from your thought. Isiliye, then only positive states of mind are possible. So, when you remove himsa from your mind, mind fills up with positivity. Do not straight away ask, uh, what if the other person is doing himsa to me? If we are established in ahimsa, nobody can do himsa to you. You know, this is a, an important law in human life. If you are by nature loving and kind and all accepting, basically spiritual, nobody can do any great harm to you. It will just not occur to them. So, ahimsa, fundamental discipline of yoga is meant for this, so that your mind achieves the stability required for yoga. This is the first discipline. Second is satya, which means commitment to truth in thought, word and deed. Iska matlab hai, what you say is what you think, what you think is what you do. The three are not going in different di directions. So, this is satya, not just talking the truth, that is only the first step. But you mean what you say and you base your actions upon what you say and think. This is satya. The third is asteya, which means non-stealing. Now, do not understand this, this is to be understood in a subtle way, non-stealing ka matlab hai, in no way you try to build up a false ego. Your copyright stealing, plagiarism, all this is included in asteya. The tendency in research, there is a huge amount of plagiarism. So, this tendency should not be there in the mind. That is being established in asteya, which means I am not borrowing that knowledge or taking that thing which does not belong to me. I am not going to flatter my ego because I am in search of the truth about myself. So, this is an essential discipline of the mind. The fourth is Brahmacharya. See, this was fundamental to our education process in the past in the Vedic age. Why is this being recommended is because you keep your energies in your hands. Brahmacharya essentially means committing pranayak energy to the heart center. When you do that, what happens? Intense clarity remains. You are in sort of free of body consciousness. You have your entire mental powers in your hands. So, you can apply the mind to anything and you will be successful there. It is essentially retaining your energies in your hands. Without this discipline, your energies remain dissipated and it requires a lot of effort to gather them together. That is why this essential discipline of Brahmacharya. There is another vital point here, which yoga, it is important for yoga. You see, where you commit your vital energies, according to that your awareness opens up. If your vital energies are committed only to the lower chakras, to the lower centers, only body consciousness will prevail. Even mind consciousness, mental awareness is not increased. But if you commit them to the heart and above the heart, body consciousness falls away. Only mental awareness remains and you go beyond even that. Higher dimensions of awareness will open themselves up to you. So, this art of committing vital energy to the higher centers was fundamental to any great achievement. 
and the science of it is being given to you in yoga. It is actually a science, retaining your energies in your hands. And it is the, it is the normal process of decent living. It is a way of living beyond mere body consciousness. So, this is another fundamental discipline stressed. Then you have aparigraha. Aparigraha means not accepting gifts. Why you know? It obligates you to the giver of the gift. When you take something from somebody, you develop a soft corner for that person. This way your, your mind which wants to get into states of yoga cannot be compromised. Its energies cannot be compromised in this way. That is why you do not accept things from others. You can give as much as you can, but do not accept. This is another discipline. Then you have the Niyama set of disciplines. Another five disciplines, the first one is Shaucha. Essentially, they are disciplines of your senses and your mind, Yama and Niyama. Shaucha is general cleanliness of body and mind. Then Santosha, contentment. If you know the art of contentment, if you have felt it, you can be happy with very little. Those who do not have contentment with a lot of things also, they can be very unhappy. So, these are all fundamental disciplines to remain in happy positive states of mind. Then there is tapas, we already discussed tapasya is turning the mind a little inward. In whatever form you do it. Tapasya. Isiliye to log kitna kuch karte hai na in the form of tapasya. Some level of self control they try to practice so that your energies increase. Hmm? And then swadhyay is good study, self study every day. See, you people study so much. I know how your waking hours are occupied. Do you do any amount of elevating study every day? 5 minute ke liye bhi Bhagavad Gita padna ya Vivekananda ko padna, something from yoga, some scriptural study. If you just did 5 minutes of study every day consciously, it will elevate your thought process. It will clear your mind. Isiliya swadhya itna important hai. You dwell on a higher thought throughout the day, through everything that you do. Whatever work you do in your room, in your classroom, in your lab, there will be an undercurrent of this elevated thought. So, it helps you in various ways. Isiliye, a little amount of self-study, scriptural study every day. I would recommend to you, there are small books, thoughts of Vivekananda or Vivekananda's rousing message. Like the small books are there, 10 rupees for 10 rupees, very vibrant thoughts of Vivekananda. You must at least keep one or two books with you. Every day read just one thought and it will just hit you. It will help you even in developing concentration, in gearing up your life towards success, it will help you. Hmm? So, this swadhya you should keep up by yourself. Aisa nahi hai ki it is part of the course, so I have to do it after the course, I will stop it. Aisa nahi hai. It is it's it's part of your life now. Then, Ishwar Pranidhan Atvat, Ishwar Pranidhan, it essentially means surrender to God, surrender to the higher power, whatever you are doing, it finally make it an offering to the divine in whatever way you want to do it. But if you only attribute things to your ego, it will take you away from the path of yoga. That is why this discipline is there. Hmm? Hey na? See, naturally they are giving you small disciplines which will keep your mind very stable. Jiske, jiski wajah se aapke jivan mein gabhirata aayegi, a certain depth will come into you. You will become a natural leader. You know, everybody will look up to you if you maintain these standards of basic living. You see small disciplines, but you develop a mind which is very high, very great, capable of all achievement. So, this is, these are the fundamentals of yoga what I told you. Now, we will go into the actual uh, technical concepts of yoga. Hmm? Yoga ka matlab hi hai, I told you, it is uniting with the real you, uniting your mind with who you really are. Technically, in the language of the philosophy of yoga, it is called separating purusha and prakriti because purusha is the self, right? And prakriti is, in your system, it is the mind. 
these two have got mixed up isn't it awareness you are not able to know understand anything by pure awareness you understand something by mental awareness awareness has got invested with the mind process and your thoughts are so dominant the psychological reality only has become dominant in you existential reality is not there in your experience because thoughts have overpowered you you are not in charge of your thoughts so in yoga language we say separating purusha and prakriti which means separating awareness from mind so yog is actually viyog between purusha and prakriti right hmm? so this is the aim now how do they do this for this there is a basic scheme and there is an advanced scheme there are four padas in yog sutras i am not going to go into that because you only need the essential information we don't have the time here also and your syllabus is such i will give you the essential points in all these uh, processes hmm? catch hold of that the the most essential thing is to dive into yoga not just to know about it it's not another thought process that you should leave with after this course you must develop the meditative mind then the purpose of the course is achieved whether you know this theory or not the videos will be with you but you must develop a meditative mind that is the purpose of a course like this hmm? so dekhe the basic scheme of yoga what is it going to tell you let me show it to you on this slide here see the basic scheme of yoga purusha and prakriti when they come together the first what is it that they generate they generate avidya avidya ka matlab hai i told you you are not able to capture the real i that is supposed to be the root of all suffering ignorance ignorance of who i truly am why because mind and self have got united and i think only in terms of mind i have no idea of what self means what this purusha they are talking of i have no idea of it i don't know what awareness consciousness means you see this is the normal experience of a mind which is not trained in yoga you do not know what the purusha means you only know the psychological reality which is going on like a high level drama in your mind all the time hai na you close your eyes you see only thoughts booming up emotions thoughts all this going on in the mind so when these two come together they are mixed up together avidya is the result ignorance is the result this is the first thing that yoga will tell you this is the root cause for all suffering when you don't know who you actually are you get mixed up with the mental process so when there is anger in the mind you are anger itself you are like an atom bomb ready to blast blow up and blow up the people around you also so this is due to avidya you don't know who you actually are you are totally identified only with prakriti only with the thought process in your mind this avidya is the root of all suffering they will tell you so what does it lead to you see the slide it leads to kleshas avidya is the first klesha the first root of the tree of suffering and it leads to the next klesh klesha is called asmi asmita which means it gives you a false sense of self individuality asmita means actually you have a sense of yourself not based on reality on the reality about you it is based on your psychological drama that is asmita a sense of individuality which is not real so it it pricks you it causes you harm it gives you pride it gives you arrogance uh, they are all the products of this asmita and as a result it will generate rag dvesh attachment and aversion these are the next two kleshas there are five kleshas totally rag and dvesh means you know there are two sides of the same coin attachment and aversion because of your false sense of ego which the asmita has built up you are constantly have strong you have strong likes and dislikes you are attracted to certain things you hate certain things you analyze any problem in your life all these factors are working your hate your anger your ego your pride your arrogance without in without being in touch with your reality all this psychological drama is taking place in the mind so what are the kleshas we just now covered avidya then asmita rag dvesha the last one is abhinivesh which means deep rooted fear 
of death. This is there in everybody. When you don't know what death is, there will be a kind of deep rooted fear. It is actually the fear of non existence. It is the fear of what if I cease to exist. You are happy to change bodies. Please know this. Even in dreams, sometimes you get another body. And you may be very happy with it. But you are frightened of the break or absence of awareness. Non-existence is the actual thing you are frightened of. Hmm? So all these are rooted in what? Avidya. You don't know who you truly are. That is why all this comes. Fear, hatred, arrogance, pride, false sense of individuality, egoism. All this is playing in the mind. Now, this leads to tremendous suffering. Abhi aap bahut chote ho. When you grow up a little, even if you have a six-figure salary, a 40-room house, a great family, you can be terribly suffering. People who have had all this, many of them have committed suicide. Celebrities commit suicide. Why? The cause for this kind of a suffering is internal. It's existential, please see. Hmm? It is not external. You have everything in the outer world, but the mind has is overpowered by all these negativities. Deeply suffering mind, depression constantly, suicidal tendencies. So, isko overcome karne ke liye hi hai ashtang yog. To put your mind into order, to get rid of all this kleshas based on avidya and attain the purpose of yoga. So, what is ashtang yog? This is the most common format of yoga given to you. Anywhere you go to learn yoga, this ashtang, eight steps of yoga will be told to you. The first two steps I already covered, yam and niyam. They are the fundamentals of yoga. Hmm? After that comes asan. Asana is actually the seat, your posture. Because when you sit for meditation, your posture is very important. It includes keeping how you maintain your physical body, keeping your spine straight. It is very important for concentration. There are certain simple techniques regulating your breathing. That is the next step, pranayam. Having proper breathing is very important to controlling mind. They can thik tara se baitna or thik tara se breathe karna. Such simple steps, they usher you into a very calm, focused state of mind. So, these are the next two steps, asana and pranayam. Hmm? Regulating your posture and regulating your breathing. After that is pratyahar. Pratyahar means withdrawing the mind. Ye sab thoda bahut aapne kiya hai. Isliye you are interested in this course. Pratyahar is withdrawing the mind from too many objects and too many thoughts. Withdrawing it in degrees, step by step. After that comes dharana, ability to maintain one continuous thought flow. Like you see, if you pour oil from one cup to another, there is a continuous flow. Isn't it? Without break. Usi ko dharana kehte hain. You are capable of this state. Dharana. Where there is one continuous thought flow, then it acquires enormous power. And that leads to dhyan. Dhyan is the next stage in Ashtanga Yoga. It means you are absorbed in your object of meditation. Dhyan itself means such a level of intense concentration that you get absorbed in your object of meditation. Dhyan magna ho gaye. Then the next stage is samadhi. This is the stage where actually you are united with the object of meditation. Samadhi means actual oneness with the object of meditation. So this is almost a transcendental state where you acquire complete knowledge of the object. Now, our objective in yoga is, what is the object? The self, the supreme self, the subject is the object here, isn't it? So, samadhi ham tabhi kehte when you are riveted, when the mind is riveted to that self, it has merged into it. This knowledge, you know, it can only be expressed as knowing by being. Because it is knowledge of your own being, knowledge of the real I, you become one with it. You know by being 
it is not knowing something objectively. Isilay, if you are absorbed in mathematics, hum usko samadhi nahi kehte, kyu? You have not become the mathematical problem or solution. In yoga, you, you actually, because it is research into your being, right? There is no objective process here, you become that. Being and becoming is the word Vivekananda used. Brahmavid Brahmaiva Bhavati is used by Upanishads. W what they mean to say is you, you become united with the object of your meditation, which is the self here. That is the state of Samadhi. Now, Isko Yoga Shastra mein Samadhi Matram kehte hai, which means it is just the first stage of Samadhi. It is not the ultimate, not the final thing of yoga. What does this samadhi do to you? It ushers you into the advanced state. See, without going into this state of samadhi, you can understand nothing of this advanced scheme of Patanjali Yoga Sutras. But some amount of peripheral knowledge I will give you, so that because we are going to the technicalities of yoga, hmm, technical aspects. So, something you will know about it, but this is to be experienced. Ye koi aise teaching ki baat hi nahi hai. But a general plan is being given to you to motivate you towards these higher levels, states of awareness. Samadhi ushers you into Sampragnyat Yoga. Look at that slide there. Samadhi ushers you into Sampragnyat Yoga, which means yoga based on pragna. As a result of Samadhi, because the focus, the goal of Samadhi is the self, your pragna. The level of awareness will be complete, intense, very high. So, it is a yoga based on this higher pragna, and that leads to what is called Ritambara pragna, which means an intuition based on the truth, the truth of pure consciousness, of the nature of the purusha. That is Ritambara pragna. A pragna, an intuition based on the truth of your true being you get sort of a kind of knowledge, an abhas of the purusha, who you truly are. Ritambara pragna, when practiced, generates what is called vivek khyati, which means you are now able to separate awareness and buddhi. See, this is virtually impossible to do in our present state of mind. How will you separate yourself from your buddhi? How can you separate awareness from buddhi? But in this state, you can do it. That is why it is called Vivek Khyati, the very peak of discrimination, where you are able to separate awareness from the buddhi, intuition from the intuitor. And this leads you to Asam Pragnyat Yoga, which means even the pragna generated here is suppressed as it were, so that you awaken into complete consciousness. See, this stage, it is impossible to understand in these terms, in our normal terms. Yoga, yoga, nagnatavyo, yoga, yoga, pravartate. You can know yoga only through yoga, and you proceed in yoga only through yoga, not through three dimensional, uh, two dimensional uh, teaching like this. You have to do it to know it. So, this leads to the stage of kaivalya, which is complete separation of purusha and prakriti, which means you know the self in its true nature. Prakriti, mind has got separated from Purusha, from the self. You know yourself and you are, you are that in that state. You enter into your true state of being, which is the state of pure consciousness. This is the yogic method according to Patanjali Yoga Sutras to attain to self-knowledge. <coughs> Starting from those preliminaries which we discussed, it culminates in the separation of purusha and prakriti and the complete knowledge of the purusha, of the self, the real I, pure consciousness that you are. It culminates in this knowledge. This is called kaivalya. So, you see you are liberated from what? From the mind, is not it? It was mixing up with the mind that was giving you all the ignorance, all the bondage because then this mind will create thought, it will create the world of sensations, it will project this world. It, the world will impinge upon your mind as it were, because you have created the mechanism for taking in that data. You are destroying that mechanism, you are destroying the mind as it were. Removing the mind so that the
the real you remains over, which is pure consciousness. Hmm? So it is liberation. Liberation from what? Essentially from prakriti, from the mind. Hmm? Remember, bondage is only in the mind. Liberation is, that is why only in the mind. It is not in the self. Vedanta will give you this tremendous insight. The self was never in bondage. It was the, this mixing up of purusha and prakriti. Vedanta will in fact tell you prakriti is unreal. You thought you got mixed up. Hmm? So, it is it's sort of an ad advancement over yoga, the scheme of yoga, hmm? which Vedanta tells you. You thought you got mixed up with mind, you were always the self. So, what we just now discussed is the yogic method to reach self-knowledge. Now, what is the proof for all this? Are there people who have attained this? Yes, there are number of people who have attained this. आपने रामकृष्ण परमहंस का लाइफ सुना है? हम्म, उनके बारे में सुना है ना? He was a man who was constantly in samadhi. That's why we take him to be God. Who was constantly in the state of complete union with the self. In fact, we have three photos of Sri Ramakrishna. All three photos have him in samadhi. ये, this was his perpetual state of mind. One day, you know, among, amongst the people who used to visit him, there was one doctor called Dr. Mahendra Lal Sarkar. He wanted to test this samadhi. What is the proof? How can a man go into such a state and again come out of it? So, he went to Sri Ramakrishna equipped with a stethoscope and with his friends. He wanted to test him. So, while talking about God, Sri Ramakrishna went into samadhi and then this doctor went, caught hold of his hand and felt his pulse. He felt his pulse. There is no pulse. He checked his heartbeat. No heartbeat. Then he went so far as touching his eyeball. He put his finger into slightly the eyes would be open when Sri Ramakrishna would be in Samadhi many times. So he, he touched the eyeball. No reaction. The whole being has withdrawn somewhere. And he said that medical science has no explanation for this. After and this man who you see apparently it appears like where he has gone. He is radiating bliss, radiating supreme peace. After a long time he comes back into the normal state and exuding bliss as it were. It affects all around him, exuding light from that frame and his words only supreme knowledge comes out of that mouth. Where did he go and where did he come back? Seeing this, the doctor and his friends were so stunned. They said that this really science has no explanation to this. This is a complete science in itself. But this is a possibility with the human experience. That you can go into a state where you get in direct touch with reality. And you stay in that state and bring knowledge from that state. So, these yogic sciences have developed from these states. Do not think that this is, these are thought constructs written by thinking. Hamare philosophies aise nahi frame kiye gaye the. They are born out of an e meditative experience. They are born out of realization. So, that is why this yoga is so powerful. If you follow the technique, you will get the goal. As much as you will follow, that much you will get. It is like that. Once you know, Vivekananda also pined for this realization of Samadhi. And when he was a young man, like any of you, he, he would go to Sri Ramakrishna at Dakshineshwar. He was a college student at that time and he would beg him, give me that state once. So, once actually in Kashipur, when he was in uh, Kashipur garden house, he attained that state. And when he went into the state of Nirvikalpa Samadhi, he started asking, where are my hands and feet? I do not feel my body. Full consciousness is there, but no awareness of the external instrument. The mind has withdrawn completely from there. Later on, while describing it to his one of his disciples, Sharat Chandra, he would say, you know, this, this dual mode of thinking, I am Brahman or I want to realize Brahman, that itself vanishes. Only Brahman reigns, pure consciousness reigns in that state. Everything else, this diversity, multiplicity of this world becomes like one homogeneous mass, an appearance in that consciousness. 
So the actual experience of Yoga Vedanta has happened in many lives. And so this is no theory. It is a method of going into the heart of reality, the reality about the human being itself. Hmm? So this is the great yogic science which we are introducing you into here. Everything depends on practice as I told you. Hmm? Now these are the yogic techniques to go into reality, awareness or consciousness. Vedanta also, you know Vedanta is another philosophy which we discussed initially. Hmm? They started as philosophical systems, but they are based on as I told you very solid techniques. Vedanta has its own methods to go into this reality. It also has upasanas, it also has vidyas, aham graha upasana techniques. You might have heard of this grasping the eye, ways of doing it. But Vedanta also has insight meditations which means you can, if you are prepared, if the mind is prepared, you can go directly into the truth. It does not even require a method. That is also a possibility. See, there are so many ways of going into this truth. This is what we are telling you. Shankaracharya, you know the 8th century philosopher hmm, who established Advaita, he in fact, he did not believe in any spiritual experience not based on Shruti. So to a certain extent, he denied the yogic sciences. Although many times he has used them, he talks about it, he talks about yogic techniques also. But in a way, he believed that the Shruti, scriptural evidence of the Vedas is very important for going into the heart of reality. So he bases his Vedanta, his understanding of Vedanta on plainly on the Shruti, on the Vedas, on the Upanishads. So we will go into some of these techniques now. Hmm? Here I would like to mention the path of self-enquiry. The path of self-enquiry, it is the direct path. If you just enquire in a very clear state of mind, you will immediately be convinced of certain very basic truths about awareness. You will be introduced into what awareness means. And if the mind is fit enough, it will, the very enquiry will take you there. Hmm. This is a, a perfect possibility. See, we are going to try it right here. Hmm. How certain basic pointers or clues you can say can lead you to the conviction of the self. Right here, we are going to try it. This is actually based upon, uh, there are scriptures called Prakarana Granthas, which means accessories or uh, auxiliary scriptures, auxiliary to Vedant. They help you understand Vedant better. So there are a number of such scriptures which Shankaracharya wrote. And in his commentaries there, he has put a number of these kinds of techniques. In your everyday thinking, using your everyday thought process, you can come to an understanding of the self, of the reality of the self. So we will just try a few techniques here. Hmm? Dekhi, abhi abhi aapko pata chalega the power of Vedant. Sit straight all of you. This is reasoning based on existential truth. Hmm? It leads to existential awareness. It is a kind of reasoning which will help you come to a particular conclusion about the self. See, just now you have to think whatever I tell you very clearly in your mind. Hmm? Just now think about it. You have a sense of I which is unpunctuated by time. What I mean by this is, you have been a very small baby, you have no memories of that state. You have been a toddler, you have been a teenager, today you are a young person. The same I is persisting, but body and mind have changed absolutely. Right? How come the same I is there when what you call personality, body and mind has completely changed? Which means there is something in you which is unpunctuated by time and space, which continues, which is constant, your eye sense, how much ever the external changes, how much ever your thoughts change, your memories change, your body consciousness changes, but that I persists. The same I will become an elderly person, will become an old person. One day it will fall, the body will fall. The I continues. Even now, your sense of yourself is not body based. Your sense of yourself is not even thought based. 
you know they are your thoughts you know it is your body not you the body your body not you the thought your thought right suppose some beautiful emotion comes into your mind you suddenly felt happy it is my emotion i felt happy it is it was my thought not i the thought your experience is always like this you are experiencing the thought you are experiencing the emotion you are experiencing the body right it's in your experience just now samajh mein aaya ye there is a sense of i in you separate from the body and your thoughts your mind you are aware of the body is the body aware of you think and tell me does the body ever say i am aware of this individual you are aware of the body if i raise my hands i am aware i raise my hands my hands are not aware of me isn't it if i close my eyes i am aware i closed my eyes my eyes are not aware of me or that they were closed i am aware of the body which means what awareness belongs to the subject not to the body i am aware of my thoughts means what awareness belongs to the subject i not to my thoughts i am aware of my emotions i am aware of this feeling in my mind you are aware of perfectly aware of everything happening in your mind which means you are apart from your mind you are apart from your thoughts you are apart from body consciousness it is a matter of will whether you identify with this or not whether you identify with your thought or not it depends on your will you want to identify you identify you don't want to identify you don't identify you remain apart this is your normal experience yahan koi yog nahi chal raha hai this is the way you are perceiving things and reality you have not observed it this way that's all one more thing let me tell you here see you are a composite of many parts this body this body is composed of many organs they are all working independent of you do they take your permission does the is the heart pumping blood with your permission or the lungs func- functioning with your permission the liver no they are doing their own job you weren't even aware of a liver or pancreas or lungs until medical science told you your sense of yourself is always apart from the body this is what i want you to observe when you take up another body say in a dream you don't mind it that much as long as your sense of awareness persists you know without referring to this physical body your existence continues as your dream proves and you don't mind it you are happy with it so actually you are only awareness this is your experience even right now functioning through this body mind complex you got mixed up because you never thought vedantically you got mixed up started identifying with this and because the whole world is always telling you you means this so you feel this is i it's a kind of adhyas superimposition but your own experience of anything is always you are objectively experiencing it so you are the subject in your awareness it is getting experienced isn't this true huh? abhi abhi aap soch ke dekho right now you will acknowledge this is true so this is basically what vedanta is telling you that you are indeed awareness functioning through a body mind complex another point let me tell you see you pass through these three states of they work with only this much data you see they had no great instruments to track anything but your own experience what does it tell this is the characteristic phenomenological method your own experience what does it tell you about yourself you pass through waking state dream state and deep sleep state now the wonderful thing about these three states is you are able to say something about all three states waking state is when the mind is active senses are active right hmm? 
just now we are in that state when you go into dream when you fall asleep and you you dream something your senses are closed in that state but the mind is active from your subconscious mind you are spinning a dream and getting totally involved with it right in your dream you don't think it's a dream it's something real when you wake up you say it's it was a dream right huh? then in the deep sleep state so you are able to recollect your dreams also in the deep sleep state what happens senses are closed mind is also closed but you say you experienced happiness restfulness and you did not experience objects so somebody was there to say you did not there was lack of experience of objects so it is an experience of absence it is not an absence of experience you are experiencing the absence of objects right you are experiencing that's why you are able to tell that in that state i did not experience objects and the state of restfulness it gives you so you were there subliminal consciousness in some way intuited the absence of objects and the presence of restfulness the experience of restfulness which means you were very much present there is one invariable passing through three variable states of waking dream and deep sleep that invariable is the self awareness persisted through all these three states that is why they are states of your mind you the self always exist the three states as it were pass over you see your own daily experience is pointing out to the presence of the self within you if you catch this logic this basic logic it comes in the mandukya upanishad that much alone is enough mandukya eva alam they say this one thing alone is enough it will strike you and tell you that this is the fact about human life how did i miss this out because vedantic knowledge was not there nobody pointed it this out to us all that vedanta does for you is it will tell you learn to think this way this is the fact of your experience kabhi kisi ne apne upar hi itna gabhir research kiya hai this is research on yourself you are researching everything under the sun even above the sun but you have not researched yourself not gone deep into yourself so this is a science which gives you this introduces you to your real self through these mechanisms one more simple thing i will just point out see if it makes sense to you hmm see now suppose i say concentrate or pay attention you will at once become alert it requires effort on your part hmm if i say well think of this particular thing again you will apply effort see to pay attention you require effort to focus you require effort to think you require effort to feel you require effort just to be self aware do you require effort because you are aware you are thinking you are feeling you are willing awareness is primary is the primary thing about you in that awareness there is mind function so all these faculties of thinking feeling and willing it's so obvious in your own experience that is why awareness requires no effort the only thing required is be still and know who you are which means actually distance yourself from the mind which is constantly busy otherwise it will drag you into its ways so self awareness is always there in that awareness you are perceiving before you go into your perceptions acknowledge this fact this is the simple thing which vedanta is telling you so there are a number of such clues or pointers which tell you truth is always as it is you don't have to add anything to it you don't have to extract it from somewhere realization itself means knowing something which already is so you just realized it that it is there not creating it see please see if you created it if you made it up it would be unreal if it is already there i came to know of it now then it is realization it was always there i my mind was not sensitive to it it had closed itself to this truth 
now it has opened up, so I realize this truth. Vedanta is like that. You just open up, wake up to reality, that's all. Last time I had told you the story of waking up from the dream, the tiger story, you remember? You just wake up to the facts, basic facts of life. You know, this process of self-enquiry is so powerful. There are people who have woken up to the reality of self just through self-enquiry. Just through the, this, these clues, they have woken up to the reality. You have heard of Raman Maharshi? Hmm? Some of you have heard. See, he was a great sage of Thiruvannamalai, Tamil Nadu, who just realized the self through enquiry. At a very young age, at the age of 16, as a young boy, you know how he realized? It is so remarkable. Huh? Just observe this carefully. Hmm? He was a young lad sitting and studying in his home in Madurai. Suddenly, in his mind, the, the fear of death came very intensely into his mind, a violent kind of fear. He thought, what is death? And then, he tried to enact, simulate death. He laid down and tried to feel what it means to die. And you know, actually that act and the ripeness of his soul actually generated a kind of mystical experience for him then and there, which means he felt his body to be completely uh, sort of removed of vitality. But yet his sense, force of his personality, his eye sense is throbbing like anything. Vitality, prana shakti is being withdrawn from the body, but his eye sense is unchanged. The full force of his personality, even the ahams furan, what is called, the eye sense is throbbing within him. In his own words, he says, I understood all this directly, even without the thought process. This became a matter of simple direct perception for me, even without too much thought, he says that I exist always, even when the body is not there. So his death experience actually led him to self-realization. Later on, he would say, you know, each of his words will hit you if this kind of an awakening comes. He says, your existence is evident with or without the body. Your existence is evident with or without thought. You exist so you are thinking. You exist so body consciousness can come, but your existence is self-evident. You are functioning through body and mind, but never identified with it unless you will it. And he used to say this self-knowledge, because he had self-knowledge immediately right there, he used to say this will always persist no matter what you are doing. It is like that Shruti, you know the monotone in Indian classical music. There is a Shruti which you hold on to before you sing the different notes. He used to say this self is the monotone which will exist, which is always there no matter what other notes you are singing. This self is that monotone. It is the common denominator of all your experiences. It is the common denominator ever existing reality before anything else comes up, before your thought begins, before your will begins, before your perceptions and sensations begin. Because you are aware, the rest of it is going on. So you see, a simple simulation of death and self-inquiry led him into, of course, he is no ordinary person <laughs> to get the experience then and there and to remain in that experience all through his life. So that was Raman Maharshi. So there are people, there are great examples right in front of us. This path of self-inquiry is so direct, it takes you directly into it. Why is it called a, the direct path? Isko technically kehte aparokshanubhuti. Iska matlab hai, it is unmediated experience. See, for normal perception, last session we discussed normal perception. You need so many factors for the object to become perceptible. What all do you need? You need the object to throw out light at you, right? That is the first thing. Then you require your senses to be in order. Then the inverted image on the retina should fall. Then 
the electromagnetic radiation is converted into your neurochemistry taken into your brain. The thalamus filters it and takes it to your visual cortex. This, this entire apparatus is required for you to perceive that thing as that object. This knowledge, self-knowledge is unmediated. You just know it by insight. None of these factors is required because it is knowledge of the self which is illumining the mind so that you can have perception. You just know that is all you can say about it, full stop. Nothing more can be said about it. Yato vacho nivartante apraapya manasasara, the Upanishads say, which means it is a state from where your mind will come back unable to reach along with speech. It cannot be reached through mind or speech. You just go into that, you just touch reality there, that is all. It is a deep level insight which translates into a kind of mystical ex experience in your system. So, this is how ordinary perception and self-knowledge are distinguished. You see, paroksha anubhuti means ordinary perception and aparoksha anubhuti is self-knowledge. In paroksha anubhuti, you require a vritti. We discussed this in the last class. A modification of your mind should occur for the perception to take place. In aparoksha anubhuti, please see, no vritti is required. The entire self-enquiry is on the aham pratyay, the I sense in you. So, no modification of mind, no mind is required. The medium of perception here was dense, cluttered in paroksha anubhuti. The medium here is absolutely clear and hence becomes like a mirror. You know, when the mind is absolutely clear, it will not function like a lens, but like a mirror. It will show you the thing as it is. It will not deflect or reflect light. It will become like a mirror. Then in paroksha anubhuti, normal perception, awareness invested is minimal because the awareness has got mixed up with the thought process and thought is dominating. But here, aparoksha anubhuti, awareness invested is complete. What we mean to say by this is not that awareness is invested with the thought process. Awareness is complete in complete full bloom in itself. With in that awareness, you are perceiving reality as it is without the interference of the mind. So, you should actually not call it invested awareness, it is awareness in itself. And finally, that is why this is mediated knowledge, paroksha anubhuti, because so many factors are required for the generation of that knowledge. But aparoksha anubhuti does not require the mediation of anything, you just know. That is why this is the glory of atma vichar or what is called self inquiry. It is not mere manan thinking. It seeks to find the foundations of self-awareness by penetrating into the immediate and incontrovertible experience of one's existence as the ego, the I sense. If you penetrate into that, you reach self-knowledge. It is an intuitive process leading to direct mystical experience. This is the process of self-enquiry, the Vedantic process. Now, based on this, there are many techniques. I told you the aham grahopasnas, eye grasping techniques, they all lead to aparoksha anubhuti. Hmm? There is another one technique which I would just mention here. We do not have too much time. I will mention here that is also a direct path leading to self-knowledge, self-discovery. That is what is called Shabda Aparoksha. Even Shankaracharya uses it. The Upanishads have certain cryptic statements called Mahavakyas, great statements you can say, which directly lead to this level of uh, discovery, that is self-knowledge, if they are heard from the lips of a man of realization, these Mahavakyas. So, they are actually scattered in the Vedas, in the Upanishads. I will just show you these Mahavakyas here, Pragnanam Brahman. It actually means Pragna, your awareness is in its purest form, it is Brahman, pure consciousness. This comes in the Aitareya Upanishad of the Rig Veda. The next Mahavakya is Ayam Atma Brahma. This self, Atman is verily Brahman. This comes in the Mandukya Upanishad of the Atharva Veda. Tattva Masi, though art that. This comes in the Chandogya Upanishad of the Sama Veda. And Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman, comes in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad of the Yajur Veda. So, in the four Vedas, you have these four Mahavakyas. 
these are statements which can directly lead to because if you actually see the words there pragna brahman atman if you have awakened to the truth about these a, a word is a symbol referring to something isn't it indicative of some particular object of experience if that is already awakened it will lead directly to the truth about brahman so these are statements which directly lead to the truth it is called shabda paroksha shabda used for aparoksha gyan aparoksha anubhuti and this is another important method used by vedant for getting self knowledge so like this there are a number of methods through which the vedic rishis arrived at self discovery in the shweta shweta upanishad you know there is there is this wonderful declaration by a rishi telling you his re about his realization i will just give you that and conclude today's session he says look how powerful the words are the rishi is saying shunvantu vishve amritasya putra aye dhamane divyani tastu vedaha metam purusham mahantam aditya varnam tamasa parastat tameva viditva atimrityu meti nanya pantha vidyate ayanaya uttishtata jagrata prapya varan nibodhata which means to say shunvantu vishve o oh, listen all ye children of immortal bliss amritasya putra he doesn't call us sinners doesn't call us confused minds he says you are children of immortal bliss you know this expression even vivekananda used in the us when he was lecturing there children of immortal bliss even those who are in the higher spheres aye dhamane divyani tastu vedaha metam purusham mahantam the rishi is saying i have known this great one this purusham mahantam this great purusha aditya varnam this luminous being tamasa parastat beyond all darkness tameva viditva ati mrityu meti this is the way to get over death to overcome death to get over our mortality nanya pantha vidyate ayanaya there is no other way other than knowing the truth about your true being that is why uttishtata jagrata prapya varanni bodhata that is why stand up awaken yourself to this knowledge and get the supreme blessing of life vivekananda tra- tra- made it into arise awake and stop not till the goal is reached hai na ye suna hai na vivekananda ka derived directly from the upanishads please see this level of knowledge and discovery is available to you if you would strive for it hmm? let us end today's session here